Friday morning, 11 o'clock in downtown Honolulu, folks. Ted Ralston here on Think Tech Hawaii with our show, Where the Drone Leads. I'd like to welcome on board today Dr. Phil McGillivray. Phil, morning, long Ted. time you've been here in Hawaii, long time you've escaped being on this show, and we got you. I'm here now. You're here now, and uh, once you're here, you come back a lot. That's how it works. Anyway, uh, just let the, our audience know that uh, a lot of the people in the world set their clocks to 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon, assuming this show is going to be 4 o'clock Friday afternoon. So, folks, you got a five hour reset on today, so make sure that you don't think it's four o'clock, it's only 11. And next week we're gonna switch this show to 11 o'clock on Thursday, so gonna keep you uh, on your toes. Anyway, uh, Dr. McGilvery, Phil, is here uh, for a conference this week and for some other activities, and uh, Phil always brings with him incredible insights and background, and uh, almost impossible to state your, your total litany of history, <laughs> where you came from, where you're going, and the things you've been able to do, Phil, in, in your life here with uh, the Coast Guard? So yes, I am the science liaison for the Coast Guard Pacific Area, which for more than 120 years has been based out of Alameda, California in San Francisco Bay. And uh, we have responsibility for the Arctic Ocean, uh, the Southern Ocean around Antarctica, as well as the Pacific and Indian Ocean was added a few years ago when we realized we needed to start doing some stuff over there as well. Um, so one of my principal job responsibilities is to uh, manage the science on the United States icebreakers, which the Coast Guard runs. And so we have one medium icebreaker that will break through about 10 feet of ice or so, and one heavy icebreaker, which is principally used in Antarctica, that will break up to 21 feet of ice. And the mission in Antarctica is to resupply our main base at McMurdo in the Ross Sea, uh, which was set up um, back around in the 19, late 1950s. And they maybe put it a little bit too far south because the ice is quite thick there, and that's why we need the heavy icebreaker to make sure we can get food and fuel into our base in Antarctica. So um, we have a number of other issues. I guess if we could get the first slide, that would uh, show some of what the Coast Guard's fundamental missions are. Um, so these are some of our challenges right now. The Coast Guard's responsibilities are uh, for search and rescue, of course, uh, for illegal fishing monitoring, safety of life at sea, um, uh, responding to natural das disasters, and uh, international and law enforcement in general, as well as I mentioned, icebreaking operations. So one of the issues that we have is um, in order to combat things like illegal fishing, um, we're trying to stay focused on persistent surveillance. Now, the Coast Guard has C-130 aircrafts. Uh, those are fairly expensive to operate. Um, and uh, so we've been trying to see how we can supplement those with unmanned aircraft. That's a, it's a great thing to say the word drone on this show because it's about drones. So I, yes. I was hoping we're going to get to that point. Okay. <laughs> well, Drones, yeah, unmanned drones. aircraft, either, it, either you know, way. You have to face wish. the fact. That's what the world calls them, so that's, that's what right. they must be. I'm fine with that. Okay. Uh, so we started, uh, I started working with unmanned aircraft uh, in 1998 with Burt Rutan. And the aircraft weighed about 350 pounds, and the ship captains thought that was a little bit too much <laughs> in case it crashed to the ship. So we've been working with much smaller aircraft since. Uh, we started in 2011 with a Raven Eye, which is a four and a half pound aircraft uh, that was developed for the military uh, and used principally in Afghanistan and Iraq. And it did very good surveillance. It's uh, been worked on quite a lot. And so it's hand launched and you literally can hand retrieve it as well. And our first use of it was off the icebreakers in the Arctic to look for ridging of ice. Uh, we have a saying in the icebreaker world that ice isn't what stops ships. It's when the ice ridges up and down, that's when you get really heavy ice. And so you want to find those ice interfere. ridges from on board without actually putting a foot patrol yes. forward. Yes, uh, well, from we drone. used to have helicopters, but the budget cuts meant that yeah. we got rid of the helicopters, so, and so that's why so we were the really cuts, moving. So when we get UAS going and the budget cuts happen there, what are we going to use? Paper airplanes. Well, uh, I think the <laughs> unmanned aircraft, the drones, are inexpensive enough that as we move towards them, uh, we should be able to use them. So the initial mapping of uh, ice ridging 
was done with structure from motion, sequential frame video. And when we started in 2011, it took about six or eight hours to actually turn the data around. Um, and the captains of the ships wanted that once, twice a day, That's in the morning. Frequency for them. Well, now we can turn it around a lot faster. And so structure from motion works pretty well if you are over land and trying to map stuff. It does not work, however, that well uh, over ice at sea in certain circumstances because at sea the ice moves. And when you're doing structure from motion and the substrate is moving, the accuracy falls off very quickly. Is there enough accuracy, enough uh, uh, resolution in the constant color ice to generate a good ice ridge picture on you, the... Yes, and uh, the, you can film in multispectral and interestingly enough, the ice ridges are in places both warmer and colder than the ambient ice. And for example, if you look in infrared, the ice ridges stick out right away because they are a much different temperature than the regular ice. I know this wasn't part of our, our thought process, but I, I just wonder if I can take this problem down the street to some guys at OceanNet after later on when we're done or something. I think maybe some of their video extraction technology might be useful in this issue of moving the moving ice in, in well it's possible it. well, but let's throw them the where, but where we're we're going with that and I think that we're getting ready um, there's a number of groups that are working with me to try and get this going the um, actual solution is inexpensive lidar laser mapping which gives you much greater accuracy and Two years ago or so, that was fairly expensive, 30,000 or more. And the processing to, to of it is, is complicated as well. Well, it does have very high bandwidth yeah. data. These are fan beam LIDARs that are 50 megabits per second. So it's more data than HD video, but you get very good accuracy. And we don't necessarily need super high accuracy for ice ridges, uh, but if you're doing something like beach erosion or you know inundation, a centimeter, and this is about centimeter scale accuracy, accuracy is what you're going for. So the price of those systems has come down a great deal now, and the systems were available, but the integration into the aircraft was not easily done. And now that's also commercially available. You can just plop it in your drone and actually get centimeter scale resolution with very precise GPS And with mapping. some reasonable, simple ground processing or off-board processing. Yes, and, and the processing can be done on the plane, in fact. So that's, 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 uh, that's incredible. It's a couple of years how much that has advanced. Yes, it's the, the advancement has literally can, been over the past 18 months or right. so we've gotten so that, to that, that level. So that brings up an interesting question. Do you think, I mean, these, what we're talking about is almost experimental approach towards things, put things together to see if it works. Is there a way that that, that could be turned into a requirements generating process where the, re the, the necessary requirements can be established well, in advance? Well, we definitely have established. So there are a number of uh, interagency federal working groups. There's one for the National Science Foundation and the Navy for unmanned aircraft. They've been discussing requirements and training requirements and operational requirements for a whole variety of different things. There's a federal interagency group, which is NOAA, NASA, the Coast Guard, uh, Department of Energy and U.S. Geological Survey. And so it depends on whether you're looking at erosion of riverbanks, where you maybe need five centimeters or so if it's a fairly large signal, or if you're looking at things like inundation and, and high tide maps, those, those accuracies are a centimeter. And for earthquake stuff with U.S. Geological Survey, they will actually try and go lower than that when possible. So people are actually using the end state that they want, the end yes. delivered product, and working backwards from there in terms of the resolution required. Yes. And that will then define what the sensors and, and the cameras look like. The other aspect of that is, so you have the spatial uh, dimension of it. What accuracy do you need spatially? How large an area do you need to cover is the other component of that. And how frequently. And the weather you have to operate in, and the temperature, so, and the yes. winds, and so, all on it goes. One of the reasons that um, I've been pushing the limits is because our operations are in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And it's always extremely windy in the Antarctic. We almost never have a day where the wind is less than 30 miles an hour. And since we work for the Coast Guard for search and rescue, we have to be able to operate in all kinds of conditions. Cloudy weather, foggy weather, uh, sleet, snow, ice. So we have sort of the worst set of possible conditions. You're a great place to get requirements from. Because if you can yes. meet the Coast Guard requirements, you can probably survive elsewhere. So we've developed a carbon nanotube anti-icing coating that you put on the wings. And and it takes just a very little bit of power and it will melt the ice off the wings, which is a big problem for us in the polar regions. Uh, there's also a silver 
nanoparticulate paint that's self-organizing into a network. And that will go over the lenses of the cameras. And so while you're filming, if your camera ices up, you could hit that a little bit. It'll melt the water off the camera, and you can continue the mission. So there are a number of issues for the polar regions in particular that are among the most demanding But you also have exist. the tropic regions. I mean, there yes. must be a similar set of requirements coming forth yes. dealing with so, sea level rise. And well, we've been... Uh, I've been supervising this some a number of graduate students who've been working on coral reef this mapping. Is, we should mention Stanford, right? Yes, mm -hmm. I am uh, one of the mentors of the Stanford Unmanned Aircraft Club, SUAV, which was S U A V E, uh, if you look online, which was founded by one of the graduate students at Stanford that I work with. Can we pull up that video? Do you think right now? Yeah. Well, I will. Okay. Let me introduce it a little bit. So, part of the issue was. Many of the unmanned aircraft simply could not handle uh, very strong winds, such as we had at sea. And some of them land in nets. We had a number of uh, experiments that we did with NOAA off of our ship with some aircraft that landed in the water, which was a problem because then you had to put a small <laughs> boat in the water to go get them, uh, which is a whole ordeal. It involves the crew of the ship, and nobody really wants to spend time doing that. And then some of them landed in the nets. But in high latitudes, the GPS fixes aren't that good sometimes. The compass gets screwed up. We're, uh, we operate near the North Magnetic Pole and the South Magnetic Pole. And so they don't always land in the net. And so we went towards uh, designing, working with Stanford graduate students to design basically an aircraft that's like the Osprey in the military, where it goes up like a helicopter, and then the rotors will flip horizontally. So we do have a video, I think, that shows part of that aircraft, which is now commercially available. Okay, and this, this was uh, very much of a prototype at this point Yes, in time. this was a prototype. It's, this is a slightly, it looks about the same now. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see that there are two uh, rotors in the front that are take off vertically, and then they flip over horizontally. And so uh, this is basically useful for ships. But one of the other key things, this is in uh, Honolulu Harbor, um, and with a quadcopter, you get 10 to 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes of endurance. But with this aircraft, because it, the engines flip over and fly like an aircraft, uh, you have much better endurance. So we get, we're getting more than two hours endurance on the yeah, same batteries that you would get 20 minutes. The ratio is about five to one in terms of uh, yeah. rotor-borne versus wing-borne uh, So this, this video shows uh, us mapping the coral reefs on Lanai, um, which is one of the least studied areas of coral reefs in Hawaii. We also mapped uh, some of the traditional, there are five traditional fish ponds on Lanai, one of which is being restored. And so we wanted to get some sort of, at least before pictures, as the restoration process proceeds. So this configuration being really evolved to satisfy a Coast Guard requirement has applications everywhere, it's not just limiting to the Coast Guard. Yes, no, no. I mean, I just needed something that would land and take off vertically mm -hmm. and work in high winds. But the interesting thing about that particular plane is that uh, Trent uh, Lukasik, who is the uh, designer and, and owner of the company with his colleagues, um, he designed it with what's called blended controls. So every single second, it's checking to see if it's a quadcopter or a plane. And what we did actually is, in 45 mile an hour gusts, we flipped the plane over. And if you do that with most unmanned aircraft, they pretty much hit the ground or go in the drink. This one, it flipped over, and it was since it was checking once a second to see what kind of a plane it was, uh, whether it was a plane or a quadcopter, it instantaneously righted itself with no human interaction. It only dropped about six feet and then continued so, the mission. Uh, adaptive control, so to speak. It was adaptive but, control without any human interaction. Let's get back to the whole subject of requirements and such, and keying off from that very observation when we get back from our first break. Okay. Aloha and haoli makahiki ho, which is Happy New Year, and I hope it's a happy and prosperous new year for you. I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute. Every week we partner with Think Tech Hawaii and produce a program called Ehana Kako. Let's work together. We bring together movers and shakers who are making a difference here in Hawaii, making a better Hawaii for everyone. If you're interested in improving the economy, the government, and society, join us every week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m., for Ehana Kako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Until you see me then, aloha. And we are back live, folks. Ted Ralston here, hosting our show, Where the Drone Leads, at Think Tech Hawaii, and Dr. Phil McGilvery. Bill, thanks again for stopping sure, by. Ted. And 
being part of the show today and that really exciting uh, first part of the show here. We were talking about requirements kind of as we got towards the break. And I was intrigued by the fact that you've told us that there are high-level thinking going on at the National Science Foundation level or equivalent in terms of requirements that UAVs and drones are going to have to think about addressing as the future comes at us. Well, NOAA, NOAA is very interested, as are some other federal agencies, in also using drones for meteorological research, uh, including air-sea heat flux, hurricane generation, uh, tropical storm studies, and one of the issues that has been persistently problematic for them is what we call the bottom 100 feet above the ocean. Uh, usually, the energy transfer and everything yes, going on there. Uh, right. Wind speed, yep. all of yep. those things. You're not going to be flying man planes generally below about 100 feet. Uh, we have some planes that drop things, sort of a, an attached drone, but really they're very interested in getting that lower level uh, because that actually gives them the information they need to know what the path of the um, uh, hurricanes would be. Really? In that 100 feet layer? There's information that bottom, yeah, that bottom layer is the absolutely key thing. They've done about everything they can with the models now, and that's the one missing component that they're very interested in using the so drones information for. information from that area could drive the algorithms and the models that predict yes, the path. it predicts the path. That's the, the key thing they're trying to do is right now, uh, they don't know where the, the storms are going to come ashore. There's a lot of uncertainty in that. And so the one thing that they think they can do to improve that is get that bottom 100 feet. The other com exam another example of what we're I trying think, to do is... I can't think of a better is, place than Hawaii to go find that out. Like well, Hawaii, Hawaii and the Caribbean, we have plenty of storms. Yeah. The other thing that they're trying to do, uh, which has been done a little bit but not very much right now, is to use multiple drones to get the three-dimensional wind field. Uh, as you know, you can go out and measure the wind at one point, but it's going to be different yeah. every place else. And so what they really want for some of the meteorological models is the turbulent spatial scale. So if you have three or four or more drones up, you can plot a path for the drone, and then the deviation from that path will give you the wind direction and speed at that, at that point. And you can, what we've been doing with colleagues of mine is sharing the data among the drones and sending it back uh, for, for uh, which allows you to get a four-dimensional wind field time. So three dimensions and over time. And there is a lot of interest in things like if you have an oceanographic front, the wind changes because the temperature on the sides of the front is different. Um, and so there's, there's quite a bit of data that you can get back at that. There's the air-sea uh, breeze that happens in the morning and the evening. Uh, there's also an ice breeze that, that happens over the edge of ice and the ocean mm -hmm. as well. And so this helps a little bit with uh, improving the meteorological models as well. But one of the other things we've been doing is using the drones for illegal fishing monitoring and for monitoring endangered species. Uh, the obvious thing that's been done with Alaska and the Alaska Pan Pacific Unmanned Aircraft Center, which as you know Hawaii is part of, is they've been using them to look at whales. Um, we've done quite a bit of work with whales with seal colonies. Uh, we've used them for seabird colonies as well. And you can actually size the animals. But we took it, uh, I would say, one step further with some of my colleagues. And we've used the drone. We started with mola molas, which are these very big, slow-moving ocean fish. And we allowed the um, software to actually recognize the fish automatically and follow them without the animals being tagged. The software on board the drone. Doing software on the drone. Automatic control on the drone. Yes. So, so it recognizes a mola mola, which are brown, <laughs> so they're quite recognizable. And then it will follow them around. The other thing that we did was to have the drone with the infrared camera actually recognize an ocean thermal front because many of the fish and turtles and marine mammals will aggregate at the fronts. So it can recognize the front and automatically start mapping the front and then recognize the animals at the front and uh, track the, and follow those as well. And so that's We've been doing that because there were some illegal fishing that was actually taking in a whole bunch of juvenile sunfish and sharks. So we moved from sunfish to sharks, which move a lot faster. Uh, but we've been able to, to automatically do oceanography and marine protected species. And we're now trying to move towards and have done some flights on automated recognition of whales. And the reason for that is that we have had a number of whale ship collision incidents. We had seven blue whales killed in San Francisco Harbor in one week, and 30 killed in LA Long Beach in a three-week period. So we would like to be able to have patrols of unmanned aircraft that would tell the ship, hey, there's a whale directly in front of you, slow down. 
And uh, what's inter interesting to me, again, is we're talking about requirements, and, and uh, we've talked about operational requirements. We've talked about science, uh, very deep science, in terms of that 100-foot layer and figuring out what's going on energy transfer-wise. The question I have is how do we bundle all those requirements or find where they're generated and feed them into our Pan-Pacific unmanned Test range well, complex. We've got to. Uh, I would say that, that. the the there you know as soon as I leave here, I'll be going back to another um, federal interagency unmanned aircraft committee, and we've only been having these meetings and trying to get the requirements really done for about the last at most three years. So I mean, we started talking about it three years ago. It's only been the last two years that the requirements have been drafted and they're being circulated. So I think you're going to see that once that comes out and people agree on it, that it'll actually have a pretty big impact. Uh, we I had would a, guess so, because we had a all, large meeting about that in January, February. I can't imagine that much of what's out there today is going to survive those kind of requirements. Uh, certainly the well, winds you're talking about and the yeah. temperatures and bearing <laughs> ice. And I, I have the harshest requirements. So yeah. there, there is one other requirement that um, I wanted to show some pictures of because I thought people might be interested. Okay, if we can pull and, up on and, the, uh, yeah, on so the we can pull we can up, up the up. other photographs, and I think oh, let's see if we got the right ones. Okay. Um, this is uh, how to operate your aircraft in GPS challenged or GPS denied environments, and so. This is a, a, a cartoon of that. And what you do is on the underside of your aircraft, you have a video camera. And then you have a parabolic mirror that's looking at the whole uh, surrounding. So let's go to the next image there. And that actually shows the video camera pointed at the parabolic mirror. And then in the next image, this is the sort of picture that you get. And th we, this was, has been called BI technology because this bees navigate by the flow field. Um, the closer you get to ground, the faster the trees are coming at you and the, you know, the more their height appears to increase. So this allows automated, um, for takeoff and landing and also airfield, airspace maneuvering, it tells you and automatically identifies where the horizon is and what the angle of the aircraft is relative to the horizon. Based on sweep rate and scene compression, scene expansion, yes. that's how bees think. Yes, and this we, is and designed pay. specifically to mimic bees. Okay, and bees hit the flower every time. Doesn't matter what yes. the wind's doing, does it? They hit it the does flower. Not. If they didn't, they wouldn't be here. And so this is so this is an interesting uh, alternative. This was developed under Department of Defense funding because there are GPS challenged environments, but many oh, places. We have them here. I was just going to say many places have GPS. If you go up yeah. in some of the poly areas and some of the valleys here, the, the mountains, the polys will block the satellites and you will be in a GPS well, challenged urban environment. Urban Canyon as well. Yes, and urban canyons as well. So this is one way uh, that I thought would be interesting for Absolutely. people to see uh, that you can address that issue. Um, and it has been worked out. It actually works extremely what's well. What's incredible, Phil, is you're the, you're the the science master between the operational requirements and the deep technology. And few people can handle that transition. Well, and so I, I thank you for... Uh, we have to have... Uh, how do we, how do we ad groom more? Adaptive, adaptive use of this. Well, I think that um, one of the things that we're trying to work with you and others to do, and others include a number of NGOs. Right now, there are a number of NGOs that have been using unmanned aircraft specifically for doing things like patrolling the turtle nesting beaches in Costa Rica, patrolling the areas in the northern Gulf of Mexico where the vaquita, the world's smallest and most endangered porpoise, um, still lives and is still at risk from illegal fishing, and also to try and monitor um, fishing around Palau, illegal fishing around Palau, and at the same time coral reef so, bleaching. So many, many uses, in particular as the sea level rise comes up, as, as, as warming comes up, we even have I issues of uh, managing the land side because uh, populations right. are going to get displaced and such, and so there's a, no end of use for this functionality as it comes forward. Well, the Coast Guard and also is one of the first responders <laughs> in, 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 in natural disasters, and so one of the key things that we need to know is where do we need to, where can, where can we safely put the Coast Guard people to begin assisting, and where are the people most in danger, where is the damaged infrastructure that we need to like, look at first? And I think what we'd like to know, mostly at, as the Pan-Pacific Unmanned Air Systems Test Range, is what are those total requirements in, in is any form we can get them, like we talked the other day with the folks from Primo, and use them to start driving the direction of technology in our research here at the university and our grad student programs and such, and also in uh, investment from uh, 
uh, private companies and such and, and get a holistic process going that's not just hit and miss but is taking real requirements well thought through such right. as you're presenting and turn them into real meaningful student projects. That would, so well, much of that we don't have. So much of this in the drone world frankly is model airplane experimentation. The, and, well the, the first we thing past that. the first thing that we did was to use okay. And we're, uh, we're coming to the end of our time here. Yep. So we did uh, a secure communications protocol. Secure communications. So data, data formatting and data protocols and data security. You don't want everybody to see necessarily everything. And getting yeah. the data format so they can well, be shared. In a very practical way, if you're making a movie. Important starts. You don't want to have a movie and using a drone to record the images for your movie. You don't want to have somebody else that, right. uh, pulling that data down and putting it on the internet. Tonight. So, so data formatting and data security are important, but the other key yeah. thing I would say, um, right now most of the data streams have been done with wireless communications, with delay and disruption tolerant networking, and that works pretty well, but the data streams we're getting now are much higher bandwidth. It's not unusual to have an unmanned aircraft with a bunch of sensors so that your data streams are in the 100 to 150 and megabytes. Most interesting so we're going optical. Optical communications are the way to solve the high bandwidth. Two weeks ago on this show, we had a gentleman uh, from a, a spectrum management company, and, we're, and we were under a lot of uh, interest from O&R and things working in terms of disconnected, intermittent, and limited or, or low bandwidth operations. Right. So we have, the, the, we have this emerging contrast between higher bandwidth requirements to for, perform the mission and potentially lower capability in terms of reliability of that supporting spectrum in order to perform the mission. So we're well, talking I want, about I want both. Stuff. I want both, Ted. Okay. <laughs> I want both. I want so, reliability okay. and, and uh, security and, and high bandwidth. And we want you back on the show next time you're in town, and we absolutely want to dial into that pile of requirements that are forming up, because that is so essential to get those requirements and push them into our educational program and into our test range here. Well, the educational component is a big uh, aspect of things as well, and so that the materials for that are still being developed, Okay, but they're coming. Okay. Well, Dr. Phil McGilvery, thanks so much for coming on thanks the show. Thanks very much, Ted. Uh, it's very time, nice to be here. You're going to have to make your, uh, your, your habit to get on this show uh, every time you're here in town. Well, I'll be happy to do that. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks again. Okay. And we'll see everybody next Thursday at 11 o'clock.